Good morning. Welcome to the K webinar Wednesday for Wednesday, the 15th of December. Today we are joined by Steve Willett of Part B, who also happens to be one of CAVE's new course trainers as well. So hopefully if you're ever at HQ um, or joining us online, you'll get to meet him personally. So for those of you who don't already know, my name is Jordan and I'm the Regional Student Services Coordinator at CAVE. I will be the moderator for the webinar this morning. We do encourage you to interact with us, so please do send in any questions or comments that you have. You can do this live via your screen today and we will go through them at the end with Steve if he is happy to do so. Or if you're catching up on YouTube and you've got any questions that you would like answered, just drop us an email to webinars at cbld.com and me and Steve will get back to you as soon as possible. As I've mentioned, this morning we are joined by Steve Willett, who is Head of Specialist Training at Part B. So Steve has over 15 years of fire safety experience, progressing to become the Head of Specialist Training at Part B just this year. His previous roles include Fire Safety Trainer, Fire Safety Deputy Team Leader and Senior Fire Consultant for BB7. So I know that Steve is eager and waiting patiently in the background. So I'm going to hand over to him now and he'll take you through his presentation. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, actually, intro, Jordan. Um, yeah, uh, not, nice to sound, uh, sound, sounds quite good there. Um, first thing I'd like to do is I'm going to share my screen with you. Um, and we are hoping that you can see BS9999 means of escape methodology on a red background has come up now. Um, what I'm going to run through with you today, it's, it's going to be a little bit of a whistle stop tour of BS9999 means of escape methodology because I've only got about an hour to go through it. Um, I'm going to try and focus in a little bit on an area that I've often felt is a little bit neglected, um, certainly in the fire safety world, which is the fire growth rate um, application that goes on there. And we will look at the other tables and how it affects things like that a little bit more in a little bit more detail, but um, we'll move on through the slides as we speak. There's about 35 slides to go through in the hour, so it, you know, it's not too much of a death by PowerPoint thing going on there. So firstly, um, what I'm going to go through, history and scope of BS9999, where it came from briefly. We'll look at the risk profiles and the way BS9999 works. It doesn't work quite the same way as approved document B. It works on the basis of an individual risk profile for a building. So it assigns a building type. Whereas if you look at approved document B, we tend to run on purpose groups, which is the use of the building only. The risk profiles is a little bit more of an analysis goes into it. So I want to kind of focus in on that a little bit. Um, once we assign a risk profile to a building, that tends to lead us towards a minimum package of fire safety measures. So we'll go through what the minimum packages will be for various different types of buildings, what you can expect to see. And then um, one of the one of the, the big pluses that you get with BS9999 when it comes to uh, building design and probably fire risk assessment as well is permitted variation. So if we up the ante a little bit on detection and warning, or we put in a sprinkler system, we get certain benefits in BS9999. If we've got a sprinkler system in ADB, we get a few benefits. We get a lot more benefits in 9999. If we put in um, an enhanced detection system in ADB, we don't really get anything back for it. So 9999 gives a little bit back for certain things that we put into a building. Um, so oh, um, for double nine double nine BS double nine double nine um, that came out about two thousand and eight um, and was updated in two thousand seventeen. Updated twice in two thousand seventeen because it came out in January and then was almost immediately rescinded because of a typo in it. Um, in the I think it was in the fire resistance section, which basically said that you could have a I think. Um, an 18 metre high building with 30 minutes fire resistance in it. So they were all basically brought back, brought back in and then reissued again 
uh, in February that same year. Um, it does happen. Um, at least it was found fairly quickly. And, and thick. But before 9999, we had this building code BS5588. And that was um, the design, construction and use of buildings for fire safety. It's basically the same as BS9999, but there were various different parts to it. And it's all been put pretty well much into one document. Some parts of the BS5588 suite of documents were moved off. Um, if you look at part one there, BS5588 part one, that is now its own separate British standard, BS9991. BS9991 is currently under review at the moment. Um, I think it's out for consultation for under changes. Um, um, most of these other bits and pieces have all been now put into BS9999. Uh, parts two and three, shops and offices, they've gone into the general text, if you like, of BS9999, as has Places of Assembly. Um, places of Assembly also has its own separate annex in BS9999, Annex D, which talks about seat widths, talks about gangway widths, exit widths, and they're in auditoria and theatre, cinema, fire safety as well. Um, Atria also sits in 9999 over annexes B and C. It's actually quite a nice, simple flow chart to follow to give you a minimum package of fire safety. And obviously it gets more complex than that once you drill down into the detail of it. But your start point, um, annexes B and C um, for Atria. So BS9999, it's a really useful document for fire safety in general. Um, it is titled Fire Safety in the Design, Use and Management of Building. So you can design a building using it, but you can also use it as a tool to assess a fire risk assessment or to audit a fire risk assessment. And in some cases, even to carry out a fire risk assessment of a building. So it's quite a good, um, it's quite a good tool there. Um, we've got, um, you know, as I say, it covers the design, management and use. It covers most buildings. It does not cover um, purpose-built blocks of flats. It doesn't cover places or where medical treatments undergoing. It doesn't cover residential care homes or anything like that, but it covers most of the places where people meet and gather. It covers most of the places where people are employed as well. So it'll cover new builds. It can be used for alterations, um, material changes of use, building. Um, one of the things that I found particularly useful for it, it's a really good tool for ongoing management of fire safety within a building um, and can be used as a tool to assess those, like, as I say, to assess those existing fire risk assessments that you can have there. Um, as I spoke earlier, it's not applicable to this list, little list of places we have here. Um, I think I covered just about all of those. They are covered under separate documentation, dwelling houses, flats, masonettes, covered under BS double, uh, 991. Um, also, you know, I mean, ADB still applies as well. Uh, residential accommodation blocks. Again, you're probably looking at BS 991 um, for their um, the nursing, resi care premises, hospitals. Well, they all be covered by the health technical memoranda. Um, there are sections in ADB to cover those as well. Um, Specialised housing similar to flats, masonettes, things like that. Um, again, BS9991 is probably a bit of your go-to place for that. HMOs, houses in multiple occupation, um, you would use the lay course guidance for management of their, again, the design and construction there, you're probably going to look at AD in the first place. So where does 9999 sit when it comes to the whole design fire safety approach? Well, if you look at what we've got here, one, the general approach, um, we use ADB. It's fairly prescriptive. Um, there are a few enhancements allowed. Um, I say fairly prescriptive. It's open enough to allow the vast majority of buildings in this country to be designed using that as the fire safety guide. So while it's while this slide says it's prescriptive, you know, you are allowed enhancements. It, it's open enough for you to be able to play with the layout of a building a little bit. Um, the second second bullet point we've got here, the advanced approach. Now it says here it's the use of BS 9999 guidance and it's based on fire engineering principles. 
you may or may not be pleased to know I'm not really going to do masses of fire engineering here today. Uh, one, because I'm not a fire engineer. And two, because we, we could be here for days, um, probably weeks even, um, just running through fire engineering principles. What BS9999 does is someone with a significantly larger brain than I have has actually gone through the, um, has gone through all of the, fire engineering documents they've done the calculations and uh, what we've done is they've reduced it down to a form of table lookups um, so we can get the information we need fairly quickly for a lot of the approach that we're going to take in bs9999 obviously if we do end up stepping outside bs9999 we exceed you know absolute red lines on travel distance and things like that then we go into part three down here and we look at the engineered approach. So, which is the use of, it says here, yes, 7974. That is the fire engineer in British Standard and associated PDs, published documents. Those published documents, um, they provide backup information, if you like, that allow you, to, you know, they, they run through the calculations. There are sections on fire service intervention human behavior, um, smoke control, tenability limits, all kinds of things like that. Um, we're not going into that level of detail today. Um, the other thing that BS9999 takes account of as well is there is quite a lot of focus on the management of a building. When you put in more engineered systems, there's a higher level of management required to keep it all together. Now, this management is often seen as the weakest link in the whole fire safety chain. Wherever you've got a fire safety failing in an alarm system or a sprinkler system, or even in just the general means of escape of the building, if you trace back far enough, there's been a management failing in it off uh, frequently. Um, that said, BS9999, it does give some benefits for management, but not, ma not masses. It doesn't give huge amounts back, certainly not in the design phase of things. But what it can do is high levels of management can reduce insurance contributions for all occupiers. And it can, the fire and rescue service, when it comes to inspection times, can actually take that into account and it can lead to reduce numbers of fire service inspections and things like that so it's certainly worth thinking about there uh, last two bullet points on this one as well we have and that is um, the effective management can contribute significantly to the occupant safety you can have the best designed building in the world you can have all all the bells and whistles all of the you know all singing all dancing fire alarm systems smoke ventilation systems sprinklers suppression systems um, if you're not managing them correctly they're not worth they're not worth the effort and the time that's that's taken to put into those buildings um in fact what you can find is that you're you're running a building assuming that your sprinkler system for example and your ventilation system are going to work together and they're going to reduce you know extract the smoke they're going to suppress the fire but if you're not managing those systems correctly if either one of those systems doesn't function as you would expect it to then I'm afraid we tend to lose it. Yeah, we tend to lose the um, the benefit of that, and we end up with a building with these extended travel distances, these reduced exit widths that isn't working the way we expect it to or the way we want it to. On the other hand, you can have a poor, I say a poorly designed building. You have a building in poor condition. Yeah, you might find that you've got extended travel distances in there, but if the management of that building are aware of that issue um, and are managing it appropriately by you know, throwing staff at it or additional monitoring of these escape routes to ensure they're clear, then wider than they necessarily need to be, then actually you can find that that can actually be an that can add significantly to the fire safety of a building. So how does BS9999 work? Well. Um, it works on this principle of A set against R set. Okay, so you can see, hopefully, I'm just going to uh, so just let me pull up my spotlight. So hopefully, you can see my red block, my red spot on on the screen here. So it works on the principle of this A set and R set here. A set is a thing called available safe evacuation time. 
Logs put too far on it's the time between ignition of a fire to the point where conditions become untenable at the point here. So our X axis along here, time measured in minutes, hours, seconds, whatever it, whatever it is, doesn't really matter at the moment. And then Y axis, this, um, there's no information on this slide that I've got here for you. This is the effects of fire. So you, you can take it as whichever effect that you, you want to consider, but generally it's a combination of all of them. It's the heat output, the smoke output, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, the further up we go, the more heat and smoke we're pushing out. So you can see at this point here, the fire has grown to a certain, uh, such a point where conditions are untenable. It's too hot, it's too smoky, people will not survive. And all we want to do is, as the fire grows, this is our red line here, so the fire starts off nice and slow, grows slowly, 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 and it hits a certain point where it starts to accelerate. You can see it's a nice... This is a nice, slow, steady curve. Generally, the curves are much, much steeper than this for a fire curve. And there's a, a point generally around about here where it sort of starts to accelerate up and away much, much quicker. But I'm just trying to get the, um, the idea of the fire curve to you. And so the way it works is there's a time from ignition to detection. This is the time it takes between the fire starting and somebody discovering the fire. And then from detection, we have the time to alarm. Someone's discovered the fire. They've got to go off and find a manual call point, raise the alarm or, or shout fire, whatever it is. You know, if it's a fire alarm system, the detection time and the time to alarm, these two are pretty well much instantaneous. So, you know, that can bring the whole graph back a little way that way. Then we have this mysterious session called pre-movement time. Um, yeah, that, that's probably the most difficult one to actually work out um, is what people are going to do before they start moving. And so this is the time from the alarm has sounded. They know there's a fire. So packing bags, um, if you're in a hotel, you know, getting up, getting dressed, um, all of those things that they do before they actually start moving. And then travel time, everything in ADP, everything in BS999 that we think about, yeah, it's this small portion here. Yeah, everything that we look at when we look at travel distances, all we're really considering is this little bit here. If we can play with the pre-movement time, we can play with the time to alarm, we can play with the detection time, we can actually have people maybe out before. Now, obviously, we don't want to be leaving the building as soon as conditions become untenable. We want to be leaving the building um, before that. So there's a built-in safety margin around this point here. And this is the difference here. A set is the available safe evacuation or egress time, ignition to untenable conditions, and R set required safe evacuation or egress time is from ignition to the actual point where everybody has left the building. And we can play with it. We can extend our safety margin or we can extend our safety margin so much that actually we can maybe have a bit more travel time. That is the idea behind um, BS9999. Now, this graph does not sit in BS9999. There's a similar one, which we'll see um, in a little bit. So I shall uh, run through that for you shortly. How does it work? We assign a risk profile to the buildings. Now, these figures here are from BS9999. 3.102, it's just a definition. And a risk profile is just a means of categorizing a building. So there's a range of occupancies that go into that building that can be in that building or in that group of buildings. And it's based on the type of people we expect to see in there and the fire growth rate that we can see. Okay, so we, we look at the fire growth rate and we think, OK, how fast is that fire going to grow? That's going to be one of our initial risk factors, if you like. Um, these clauses here, 6.4, where a number of risk profiles apply on an assessment, uh, apply, sorry, we have to assess each one individually. OK, um, an assessment must be made of the reliance on each occupancy type on the prescribed fire precautions, where you've got a number of different occupancies that affect each other. So they're all sharing, for example, a means of escape or something like that. You may well find you've got to use the most conservative profile across the board where they're all completely separate. There's compartments between them all. 
well, then in that case, you may, and I will use the word may, you may be able to actually assess them individually all to their way out. But it's going to depend, I'm afraid, very much on what you get at the time. So the first thing we're going to look at then, so we look at the occupancy characteristic. This is going to form part of our risk profile of our building. So what you've got is there's four occupancy characteristics here, A, B, C and D all quite simple. Um, a, uh, occupants who are awake and familiar with the building. Typically, this is a place where people are employed. Okay, so what you're looking at, the examples we have there are office and, ind and industrial premises. Um, what you're looking at is the largest number of occupants. So, you know, I mean, office and industrial premises, that's a pretty good example of the type of things that you're looking at there. Um, these people are trained, they're told what to do in the event of a fire. Uh, they're pretty disciplined. Um, they may not think it, but they are actually pretty well disciplined in what to do. They hear a fire alarm test every week. They go through the motions of a fire drill every year, year or six months. They know where the fire alarm assembly fire excuse me fire assembly point is, and you know they know what they're supposed to be doing. Then we come on to occupancy characteristic B down here. Occupancy characteristic B. They're also awake but they are not so familiar. Now, the examples we've got here are shops, exhibitions, museums, leisure centres. Uh, these are the places where members of the public gather in significant numbers. Yes, there will be um, occupancy characteristic A in there, there will be employees in there, but the vast majority of people in those buildings are going to be occupancy characteristic B. Um, they're different from A because they're not trained, they're not disciplined. You cannot train the public um, before they go into a shop or before they go into a theatre or a cinema. So they don't know what to do in the event of a fire. Um, and studies, you know, there are studies out there where you can see that people um, sitting in a building, they can hear the fire alarm going off and they carry on with what they're doing unless somebody will actually come in and say, right, come on, guys, it's time to move, it's time to get out of here before the fire goes before. Um, thing, conditions accelerate away from us. So occupancy group B, it's a different occupancy characteristic. Now C, C is broken up into C1, C2, C3, um, all in your Roman numerals as you see here. Uh, basically C1 and 2 are not generally covered by double nine, double nine. So all you're really looking at is C3 down here, this short term occupancy. And if you look at what it's talking about there, Really, in double nine, double nine, you're only thinking about hotels. That's really what it comes down to. Um, I think in some cases you can look at hostels, um, depends upon the use of them. But if you look at C1 and C2, both of them are long term occupancy. And that is the, that's the key difference. Short term occupancy, occupancy type C3. That's what we're looking at there. Now, I've talked about C1, C2, C3. They've all got one thing in common occupants who are likely to be asleep it doesn't matter if they're awake alert sorry not awake excuse me it doesn't matter if they're uh, familiar with the premises or unfamiliar with the premises this is the dominant problem that we have with them they're likely to be asleep their response is going to be significantly slower than someone who is awake whether they're familiar with the building or not okay and then there's a fourth one, D, down here, occupants receiving medical care. Uh, this table I've just lifted straight from BS9999, occupants receiving medical care. We don't generally look at those occup um, occupancy type B in double nine double nine, and um, it's only really mentioned here or only put in for completeness. So occupancy type D, occupancy characteristic D, sorry, we don't consider any further. So we, we would not be using BS9999. For this sort of building there. So that's how we look at the occupancy characteristic. And then we want to look at the fire growth rate. Now this um, this one causes a lot of problems. Okay, so what we really want to be looking at is an individual assessment needs to be carried out for every premises, um, and you need justifications for selecting specific fire growth rates. Now, these fire growth rates that we've got here, these are standard fire growth rates, if you like. I'll, I'll explain where they come from shortly. Um, you may find that you've got areas where a significant quantity of dangerous substances or preparations are stored. 
um, or there's ancillary accommodation in areas um, with the exception of kitchen storage plants there, they're generally allocated a high fire growth rate, okay? So it says here, high fire growth rate, assessed very fast, but you know it's also termed as a high fire growth rate. Um, you may find you've got, for example, um, a commercial kitchen with a bank of deep fat fries where you can say, well, actually, that is probably going to be a pretty fast or maybe even ultra fast fire growth rate because it can grow and develop really quickly under the right conditions. If you've got a localized suppression system that covers just that area, you can actually re um, consider reducing your fire growth rate down. Even though, um, even though you've got that high fire growth rate, that fire growth rate is controlled by the localized suppression system, be it you know phone delivery or whatever it's going to be. If it's controlled, instead of actually assigning a fast fire growth rate, you can still take it down to a medium. Okay. So these fire growth rates, they're, they're fairly standard um, fire growth rates. Now, what people tend to do, certainly in the fire and rescue service, is they just stampede towards this last column here. And they say, right. I've got right. I've got a reception area. That's going to be a slow fire growth rate, or they'll go to oh right. I've got a warehouse. Well, that's an ultra fast fire growth rate. What I would say is consider what is being stored in that warehouse. And um, in fire safety, we love an extreme, um, two extremes: a warehouse that stores fireworks. Compare that to a warehouse that stores concrete gnomes or concrete blocks or concrete goods with no packaging you could not say they've got they're going to have exactly the same fast fire growth rate um, but this table doesn't really give you much um, best way to look at this table is look at the description you look at category one slow fire growth rate evenly distributed low level fire load small discrete packets of fuel or material of limited combustibility so you've got small islands of um, low combustible material. That's going to give you your slow fire growth rate. Okay, so don't necessarily have to go straight to these arms. Have a look at what's written down in the description. If you look at the fast fire growth rate, stack combustibles. Fire loves to move vertically. Heat rises, smoke rises. If you've got stacked combustibles, so cardboard upon cardboard upon cardboard upon cardboard, fire is going to rip through that pretty quickly. We're not looking at the total fire size in the building. We're looking at how fast it grows. That's where it comes from. Um, I've, had, I've, I've had this argument with fire risk assessors and fire, fire officers all the time. So, well, it's a warehouse. You know, that's an ultra fast fire growth. Rate. Well, not always. Yeah, you've got to look at these. You've got to look at these descriptions each and every time. So, play, you know, when you are looking at this fire growth rate, you know, this is probably, this is, if it's going to go wrong, um, your design or your fire risk assessment, it's probably going to be in this here. You need to look at, to look in quite a significant amount of detail at what is actually going to be in that building to ensure that you get the correct fire growth rate for your building. Um, as I say, these are standard, um, standard fire growth rates. They come from the fire engineering document. And they come from here. Now, this, um, this is a table, and I can't remember which one it comes from. It comes from one of the published documents in the, in the BS7974 range. Um, but these figures aren't just used in the UK. Uh, P, it, this comes from PD7974 part one. Um, and it all comes down from the time to reach 1,055 kilowatts. OK. So an ultra fast fire will hit 1,055 kilowatts in 75 seconds. That's a pretty quick fire. OK, and then it's a doubling of time. So a fast fire growth rate will reach that same figure, 1055 kilowatts in 150 seconds. And then a medium 300 and a slow 600. Um, 1055 kilowatts is quite a weird figure. And I did a little bit of research and I found out that 1055 kilowatts is equivalent to 1000 British thermal units per second. 
Okay, so it's going harping back a little bit to olden times, but um, one British thermal unit is the energy required to raise one pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. So you might say, why are we still using that? Well, it's actually quite a useful figure because it transfers across quite nicely between the British thermal unit and the kilowatts. There's only I think about 5% difference between the two. So historically it's proven to work a bit like the two and a half minutes to evacuate a, com a compartment yeah historically it's proven to work so we tend to stay with it and it works quite well you'll find these you'll find these fire growth rates are used pretty consistently um, across the board um where certainly in fire engineering documents um if you look at anything P, you know, in any of the, the published documents, and you think, okay, I've got a slow fire growth rate, they are actually going on this table here. This is where it comes from. And they are, these are, if you look at what you've got there, table two, standardized alpha T square growth rates. Remember that curve I showed you earlier in the presentation? That's a T squared fire growth curve. So, um, there's not a lot more help in BS999 about these fire growth rates, but there is help in other documents. OK, now these tables, again, come from some of the published documents in BS7974. OK, um, and there's a number of, you know, there's a number of tables that you can use. There are other documents that you can look at as well. You can look at the... Um, the SPFE handbook um, that's got heat release rates of many common materials, but you can look at the sort of build, uh, materials you're expecting to find in a bit. So if you've got an office, an office reception workstation, well, you've got a fire growth rate of 0 .0 .0 0 0.003 kilowatts per second. Yeah, so this, these are quite useful little tables. You will not find these in BS999 um i'm afraid there used to be a table in bs 9999 for 2008 version and that gave you typical um risk um risk profiles for typical occupancies but there was none of this thought it was just basically a table that said or oh, uh, an office would be considered to be this um a shop would be considered to be this um that table doesn't exist in bs 9999 anymore because same as people look go straight towards that final column in the fire growth rate table they will go straight to that secondary set of tables and just say right okay it's an office that's our fire growth rate there was no analysis of what's going on in the building try to put i've got this slide in here just to give people a little bit more of an idea of the sort of things you can look at there table a4 um it's slightly different for these different fuel assemblies um, this one's related to the occupancies um, and it gives you the heat release rates per unit area. Another way that you can look at it. You've got a shop. Um, so your shop it gives you a range 270 to 1000 kilowatts per square meter. And you've got to look back and go here. OK, what's the shop selling? Is it selling, is it selling beds or is it selling I think, bedding? Yeah, if you're selling bedding, you're probably going to be looking more towards the 1,000. If you're selling, um, again, if you're selling my favourite, you know, the concrete gnomes, you're probably down further towards 270. So again, that's quite a useful little um, set of tables. Um, like I say, you will not find those in BS 9999, I'm afraid. Uh, another table you can get um, that I've i've dug out and found for you as well um it's fire growth rate of typical items in a building and this one it doesn't give you the kilowatts per second or anything like that um there are references out there for where things have come from but um, you know wood-based materials typical fire growth rate slow yeah wood furniture timber books someone looks to make someone looks at a bookshop for example say right well it's a bookshop there's paper in there, there's cardboard in there, but it's they're stacked up vertically. You might say, well, that could be a fast, could be an ultra fast, not likely to be. But your actual materials, your wood based thick materials, timber and books, typically you look in there at a slow fire growth rate in there. But again, look at how many, how many stacks of books there are 
look at what you've got within the building there. A thin material, thickness less than 20 millimetres, you go from, all of a sudden, there's a massive leap from slow, fast, and ultra-fast. So, you know, again, this table gives you a little bit more information, but you've got to be able to justify where things are going to come from. Hopefully, they'll help with signing that initial fire growth rate. Because like I say, if you get this risk profile wrong, your whole building could actually turn out to be wrong. Um, one other thing before we go on to the tables on there and we look at the, the whole um, design process, um, sprinklers. Sprinklers will have an effect on the building. Now, this graph I've put up here, this you'll find in BS999 without the curve I've put in. I talked about A set, R set earlier. Well, this is the A set, R set graph, if you like, that sits in BS9999. So it's broken down. You see you've got ignition, time to alarm, alarm time, pre-movement time, available safe egress time. So you can see it's kind of the same sort of thing. And what I've done is I've put a fire growth curve on there. OK, so you can see that fire starts off nice and slow and then it gets to a point about here and it starts to accelerate up. And we want to be getting out of the building at the green line long before we hit our tenability limits there at point eight. OK, so what happens if we actually put a sprinkler in a building to that fire? Well, it's growing like that, um, unsuppressed. Yeah, uh, that's what's going to happen. But the minute we put a sprinkler system in there, the sprinkler system can detect and attack the fire. So our fire it grows. It grows more slowly. You can see this curve. It's so much shallower than the other one. And what we've done is we we had our initial safety margin at this point here. But what we've done with our sprinkler system is we've actually increased our safety margin by this by this amount. Now you might say, well, there's no you know there's no real benefit of that. We we've got out a safe point here. Well, what we could actually do. We could actually look at this travel time and we could actually leave the building at this point and that allows us an extended travel time and we are still leaving the building with a safety a good safety margin ahead of us in fact if anything longer than we had before so that is the effect of sprinklers and what they do um, they reduce that fire growth rate by one level so let's put it all together so what we have is we look at our building and we say, OK, what type of people do we have in here? Do we have occupants who are awake, alert and familiar, awake, alert, awake, alert and unfamiliar, or are they likely to be asleep? So that's the easy, really. That's where we learn that. We then look at our fire growth rate. We've got to look at the, what's in a building. OK, We've got to look at what sits in there. Um, what, how fast is our fire growth rate likely to be? And um, you want to see some pretty good justification for that, really. Um, at least some sort of analysis of what materials are going to be in there, how they're going to react to fire. And we combine the two. So A, occupants are awake, alert, familiar. We have a slow fire growth rate. We have a risk profile A1. And you can probably imagine that if they're awake, alert, familiar, there's a slow fire growth rate, that's the, the best one we're likely to get because the people are disciplined, the fire grows slowly. We're probably going to get most people out of there. If you look at C, occupants were likely to be asleep and we have an ultra fast fire. Well, the fire grows really fast. Their reaction time is going to be slower. That's our worst case condition. But what you will find, um, so if you look at C4, A4 and A4, they've got this little note by them, A. These categories are unacceptable. So if we've assessed something with an ultra fast fire growth rate, it's unacceptable. But what we can do, we can put a sprinkler system in the building. The effect of that sprinkler system is it drops our fire growth rate by one level. So a C4 becomes a C3, a B4 becomes a B3, and an A4 becomes an A3, and they are acceptable. Now, obviously, if you've got an A3 and it comes an A2, that's still a good thing because that might give you longer travel distances. It might give you narrower exit widths. Um, subscript C as well, if you look here on C3, um, I'm not going to go talk about uh, subscript B because we, we've gone through that little bit already, but subscript C, um, this is something that doesn't get 
I think, um, talked about that much either. Risk profile C3 is unacceptable under many circumstances. So C3, even if you even if you've got fast fire growth rate, if you've got sorry, if you've got a fast fire growth rate and people are likely to be asleep, you still are not likely to accept it. If you've got a fast fire growth rate, you either reduce the fire, the fuel load in there, reduce that fire growth rate, whatever way you can. But if you put a sprinkler system in there, your C3 becomes a C2 and it becomes acceptable. So sprinklers give you a lot of benefits and you'll see where they come from as we go through the tables. Now, um, what we tend, S999 has this next table in there. It's basically a little flow chart. I've had to mess with it a little bit, but the, the flow of it is basically the same there. What we do is we determine the risk profile. Okay, so that's the very first thing we need to do. And then we think, okay, do we have sprinklers in there? Yes, no. If we do, it reduces our fire growth rate. And then we look at the minimum package of fire protection measures. So I'm going to go through all that shortly with you all. Uh, we collate the following information to help plan the media escape. How many people do we have in there? We look at our travel distances. We look at the width of our corridors. And then we assess the compliance of that means of escape. That is basically our minimum package. Can the means of escape can be made to meet the client the requirements using the patron guidance? Um, I'm not really going to go into this next section here because the layout can form a construction of firefighting recommendations. Um, Seriously, we haven't got the time to sort of go into that in, well, we haven't got time to go into that at all. Um, we look at the means of escape sections only. Um, there may be additional distance requirements that come into place that say, well, actually, uh, yeah, your travel distance is X, but we need we need that distance to be reduced because of firefighting requirements. So that's one thing. If we can answer yes to all of these questions, our building is OK. Our building is good for the means of escape. We can get out of there. Um, one thing I um, didn't mention earlier when I was talking about the presence of sprinklers, BS999 is quite clear on it. It does state sprinklers. Um, it does not consider things like water mist systems um, or anything else like that. They may or may not have a protective effect on the building itself, but they will definitely have a protective effect on people within the building. Um, but BS999, it doesn't really recognise water mist systems or anything else just yet at the moment. So. We'll go through this process first. We'll go through where we can answer everything. Yes, 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 yes. Um, and we'll look at that and we'll see what we can do outside of that. So the way BS999 works, most thing or that everything comes from this risk profile. And all we do is we apply these tables to our building. So if you look at um, table seven within BS999, it will tell you you need a minimum level of the fire detection and fire alarm system for premises. If you look at an A1 building, well, our minimum acceptable detection alarm system is a category M. It's just a manual call point system, red manual call box, call point boxes at the exits and every 45 meters or 25 meters, depending upon the exit. A2, it's an M system. If you look at a B1 and a B2, it's also an M type system. And these things, um, they've both got in you know, both got a slow or a medium fire growth rate. Once we get to something a bit faster, a fast fire growth rate, well, we want to pick it up a bit quicker. So now we up the ante and say, well, actually, we want an L2 system in there. Now, table seven's pretty clear in what it says: minimum acceptable detection and alarm system. So if you put an A1, an A1 building. If you want to put an L3 or an L2 or an L1 system in, crack on, do it. Um, you will get a benefit for it, and I will go through that later. Now, when we look at the C buildings where people like to be asleep, um, hotels, if predominantly is what we're talking about in L999, it likes an L1 system in there. Um, if you look at the fire safety guides, it generally recommends an L2, and I think um, ADP. I'm going from memory because I don't have it open in front of me. I think that that is happy with an L2. So BS999, while it gives you benefits, where you've got a sleeping risk, it actually ups the protection levels that you'd expect to see. So we've 
assess their risk profile, and that leads us to what type of alarm system we need to put into a building. Nice and easy. Um, subscript B that you'll find on B1, B2, B3, where we've got members of the public, we can't train them, they're not disciplined. Um, it says here, in some circumstances where people are in an unfamiliar building, the provision of a voice and or visual alarm system can re help reduce evacuation time. Um, where you've got a voice alarm in a building where you, predominantly it's employees, that may or may not have an effect, but it will definitely have an effect where you've got large numbers of members of the public. You hear an alarm in a building you're not familiar with, firstly, you, first thing you do, you look up, you look around, you try and get more information. What's the alarm for? You don't know whether that's a burglar alarm, you don't know whether it's a fire alarm, you might not even know if it's a car alarm outside or something like that. But if there's a voice, even a recorded voice that says, ladies and gentlemen, please leave the building by the nearest exit, a fire has been reported, you're going to respond to that so much quicker, so much better than if you had no guidance at all. Uh, fire alarms are covered in page 63 in BS um, or 999, not to the extent uh, that you'd find in 5839. It's just about the provision of what type of system you'd expect to see. We will move on then to table eight, and that talks about the emergency lighting system. Uh, it's not so interested in the risk profile, but it is very interested in the occupancy characteristic of a building. Um, occupancy characteristic A. Um, it just tells you these are the areas that need emergency escape lighting. Um, occupancy characteristic B, it'll tell you this, and occupancy characteristic C, it'll tell you that as well. Um, the one thing, and I've been guilty of it as well in exercises and all sorts, I always forget the very bottom line here, any use. Yeah. So occupancy characteristic A, it's all of this and all of this. Occupancy characteristic B, it's this group here and all of this group here as well. Again, it's not going to have the same level of detail as 5266, but it gives you a start point. It helps you with the design of your building. Once we start to move towards the numbers of people, we look at table nine. Uh, table nine, again, it doesn't really use the risk profile. But what it does is it gives you use type of building, office shop, standing areas, seating areas, and it gives you typical densities um, of floor. It's a bit like table D1 in ADB, but nowhere near as detailed. Um, by all means, use this. They are, they are a clue more than anything else because table nine, the title gives it away. It says examples of typical floor space factors. Same rules would apply as for ADB. If you can get the information from other sources, there's not a problem with that. It's just a case of justifying where those sources are. Um, I've often said to fire safety officers, if it's not sitting in there, look at table D1 in ADB, look at similar premises, look at I don't know where you can find all kinds of things there always worth um it's not pick and mix it's not a pick and mix approach what you find is that this table is not actually that detailed or it's not that wide ranging sorry in bs double nine double nine so you've got to find your information from somewhere and adb is a uh, pretty good one to go for there table 10 you're probably all very familiar with um it's exactly the same as um, in ADB, and it's just the minimum number of escape routes from a room tier or story. Please remember this is the minimum number of escape routes. If you cannot get to your exit point within a specified travel distance, you've got to put in additional exit points. So um, table 10 probably doesn't need a great deal more discussion other than that there. Table 11, so then this is where the calculations start to come in and we start to look at travel distances and we're back on the risk profiles now. The reason I bang on and on and on about the risk profile, travel distances, you know, it's a key thing. It's all part of that A set, R set calculation. Travel um, equates across as time, effectively. We're going to take an amount of time to get from a point in the building to our final exit point. And our risk profile takes if you like our travel distances now adb gives you a two-thirds rule um well nine double nine just gives you two sets of figures it gives you direct travel travel distance and it gives you actual travel distance and if you look at a1 our start point for actual travel distance is 65 meters two-way travel 
That's 20 meters more than ADB gives us. Yeah, because we've got a slow fire growth rate, we've got people that are disciplined, they're going to react better to fire. We take account of that. It goes back to that whole ACET RSA calculation. What I will say is if you look at C, C2, uh, travel distances, our two way travel distances, 12 direct, 18 meters two way. So double nine, double nine doesn't give you a lot back for sleep and accommodation, but where you've got employees, where you've got numbers of members of the public, you can get some quite significant travel distances. You get more usable space. Um, One-way travel, our figures, uh, 17 and 26. If you look at these figures, they're actually roughly, and I will say roughly, two-thirds. So rather than sit down and doing two-thirds calculation, Table 11 has just given you um, figures separately there. Once we've assessed our travel distances, we're going, going to look at our exit width. Um, table 12 gives us our exit width, and again, it comes back to our risk profile. Risk profile A1, 3.3 millimetres per person. We work out how many people are going to be heading towards that door, multiplied by 3.3, that gives us our exit width. Thing to remember, we have an absolute minimum door width in BS9999 of 800 millimetres, not 750 as we normally expect to see. Okay, so our minimum door width of 800 mil is applied. If um, we calculate our risk, we calculate our door width of being 795 millimetres, we are going to be applying an 800 millimetre door. We're going to put that on there. Okay, uh, usual rules apply as always. 9999 doesn't give us any benefit on that. We must assume the larger capacity exit is lost to fire. Okay, every single time, even in 9999. If you look at uh, say, if you look at C2 here, yeah, you can see where the difference applies again. C2 is 4.1 millimeters exit width per person. Right. One thing that came in in BS 9999 2017 was an exit check calculation. And now I've struggled to teach this before, um, certainly with um, fire safety officers and, well, just generally, because you think BS 9999 takes you through, um, takes you through tables, 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 and then all of a sudden you've got a calculation to do. Clause 16.61 uh, gives you another check to do. We have our minimum door width is 800 millimetres, but we calculate our exit width according to the number of people that are approaching that door. Um, if we calculate our door width at a figure of less than 1,050 millimetres, we've got to do one more check. And what we do, we take the figure 500, and we divide it by this figure here. So if you've got an A1 building, you would take 500 and divide it by 3.3. If you've got a B2 building, you would take 500 and divide it by 4.1. And that's gonna give you a figure. That figure is the maximum number of people that a door width of less than 1,050 millimeters can accommodate, okay? So if you've calculated, you've done that 500 over the table figure and it comes in at, say, 139. If you've got 140 people approaching that door, you've got to have a 1050 mil door. It's, it's that, that's it. Um, and I, I, I'm not trying to be little fire safety officers. It's, it's just I've spent most of my time teaching fire safety officer so I'll, I'll say um, you know I struggle with it with fire. I probably struggle with it with just about anybody teaching it because um, well nine double nine I'll get people into the, the mode of use tables use tables use tables and then throw a calculation out so next couple of slides it's just a little bit of an example so we have an A2 profile pudding and our millimeters per person we calculated as 3.6 the figure 500 Divided by 3.6, it gives us 138.8 people. So if we've got 139 people, there's a bit of an argument. You say, well, actually, that's 138. You don't get 0.8 of a person. You know, you might think it's 139. It's not going to make a massive, massive difference in the grand scheme of things. So 138 or 139. Once we're over that, over this figure, 
it's a magic figure of 138 or 139, we've just got to put a 10, 50 mil dollar in. And that's why this calculation's here, because that number of people isn't going to change, you know, even if you reduce your exit widths millimetres per person. The figure 500 is constant, it's always here. So we've put 500 over 3.3, 500 over 3.6, 500 over 4.6. And that is the way it works. So there's another example there. It's a for a B3 building, yeah, 500 divided by six, it gives us 83, 84 people. So anything above eight, there's more than 83 people approaching your door, it's a, then we need a 10, 50 mil door. Okay, um, look at the stair widths of a building, works pretty well much the same way. We look at the risk profile of the building, we look at the minimum width of stair a person served over the total number of floors served. It doesn't work quite the same way as ADB. How many people do we have in the staircase? Yeah, well, 100 people, serves one floor, 3.9 millimetres per person, or 390 mil stair. But our minimum allowed stair width is 1,000 millimetres anyway. Yeah, so stairs never going to go below a thousand millimeters for downward travel. If we're in a basement traveling upwards, it's twelve hundred millimeters. We do discount the stairs, same as we do for ADB. Uh, this slide here gives you a little bit of a comparison. Um, ADB, we assume one stairs lost for fire unless we've got protected lobbies or smoke control. Okay, if you put a sprinkler system in a building under an A under ADB you're still discounting your stair. Well, BS999 is different. It says if you've fitted sprinklers into your building, we've got all stairs available. We do not lose a stair if the building is fitted with sprinklers. And we still do not lose a stair the building is fitted with protected lobbies or smoke control. So that's quite a significant buyback that you get in BS999 for putting sprinklers in a building. Yeah, you reduce your fire growth rate, you extend your travel distances, you reduce your exit widths, and you don't have to discount the stairway in the event of fire. So you get quite a good bit back, BS9999. That's the minimum package fire safety measures. Okay, so we said yes, 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 we can do all of that, and our building's okay. But we can't always say yes to all of that. And you may find that actually, we can't we can't hit our um, our travel distances or we can't get our exit widths correct on there. So what we can do is we can look at additional fire protection measures and then we can think, okay, does it work? We'll go back and we'll put in additional fire protection measures and then we go back through this loop again. And if we can't get out of this loop, we've got to go down the dark path of fire engineering or are additional fire protection measures bring it into line then yes we can still say it's okay so what are these additional fire safety measures well i talked earlier about um the minimum levels of detection and warning if we provide enhanced automatic detection and it provides this thing here called a clear benefit well what that does is that gives us a 15% increase in our travel distance. So that's 65 metres for an A1 travel distance. That goes up by about nine metres, 65 plus nine, you get about 74 metres all of a sudden, two-way travel, just by providing enhanced automatic detection. An A1 building required a minimum of a um, category M. If we put an L3 alarm system in there, is that going to give us a benefit? Are we going to know the fires there any earlier? Yes, we probably are. So we'll get moving earlier so we can actually have an extended travel distance on that measure. But it's not just the travel distance. It says and a 15% reduction in exit and stair widths. So we can also reduce our exit widths. Bear in mind, we cannot go below those figures of 800 millimetres or 10, 50 millimetres, depending on how many people are going down below, going down there. So I think really the benefit that you get here is the 15% increase in your travel distance. That's what you're looking at there. And another enhancement we can get is higher ceilings. High ceilings act like a smoke reservoir. It takes time for the smoke to get up to the ceiling, hit the ceiling and start to spread out um, and eventually cut off your escape route. 
Um, we look at the entirety of the escape route with the exception of corridors, corridors and lobbies. So basically once we're out in the corridor, you're going to have a probably have a lower ceiling anyway, but we don't, we're not assuming that smoke's getting in there. If you've got a very high ceiling in your fire compartment, the smoke's got to get down to that level before it can even get into the corridor. So the higher the ceiling, the more time we've got. And yes, double nine double nine gives us another table. We like a table in double nine double nine. So we get X, we get extra travel distance and we can reduce our door width, our corridor width, and our stair width as well using these higher ceilings. Um, so three meters or less, yeah, we don't get anything. There's no additional benefit for it. But once we go between three and four meter high ceiling, we get an additional five percent. Now that is in addition to 15 percent for our alarm system as well. You can add the two together. So 15 and five, we've got a 20% increase now in our um, travel distances, just by having a ceiling height 3.1 meters high. That ceiling height is measured clear of all obstructions. It's not a case of if you've got a pitch roof, take the average and say it's that. You, it's the ceiling height is clear of any obstruction that you've got there. Um, uh, up to a greater than 10 meter high ceiling, you get an extra 30% on your travel distance and obviously 15% on your, um, for your alarm system as well. So you get significant benefits for these. These are your clause 18 enhancement. These are your additional fire protection measures. And if you can bring your building into line using these two figures here, then we, um, then we go, we've got a good, we've got a good building we can use it. Now, obviously there are lines that we don't cross. Um, and what architects and designers tend to do is, is probably go to these two tables first and think, right, I want a travel distance of X, Y, Z. What do I need to put into the building to achieve that? Um, and these tables, these are the lines that you never cross. OK, so table 15 says only one risk profile, maximum permissible travel distance. Yeah, 90 metres one way. In theory you can have a corridor 180 metres long with an exit at either end um, in this condition here. Um, C1, yeah, 37 metres one way. So it's only just longer than um, ADB allows at 35 metres. You sleep in this corridor there. Um, and one way distance is 18, 28, 30, but we don't cross these lines. Okay, so if you've got a 91 metre travel distance, well, you're taking it down to 90 every time because you've already given an extension for the alarm system. You've given an extension for the high ceiling. There's nothing else that you can give now. Yeah, you've gone through a whole process to actually get to this 90 minutes in the first place. Table 16 gives you minimum pull width per person. Again, bear in mind that you've got those 810 50 mil limits. And then S yes, double nine double nine loses a lot of credit, not credit, it loses brownie points as far as I'm concerned here because 18.4.4 it gives you a maximum allowable reduction in the stair width of 25 percent, and that's what it says. Um, everything else it's done, it's given us a table, uh, you know, you've got a look up table, look up, and you can go with it there. Now, I don't mind percentages, I don't mind maths, but I know that um, not everybody can sit that will sit there quite happily and go, Oh. Can't, can't I have a table? Well, because I'm a nice guy, I've produced a table, and that is the 25% widths for the staircases, um, as a, as in a as in BS double nine double nine. You will not find this document. You'll not find this table in BS double nine double nine. So this is just me. I've done the calculations, put them all up there in one place for you. Um, I will add a disclaimer on there. That's my maths. It's not um, an official document or anything like that, but um, I tend to find it. It's quite an easy one to look at there. And that, ladies and gentlemen, I believe is an hour. Um, we've got a couple of questions on the Q&A there. Um, someone said, how can double nine double nine be help to a coffee shop having a storeroom? and a public WC in a basement served by a single stair and no direct protected route to fresh air. Residential use above, and no shared facilities. Okay. Um, 
I, I couldn't really sort of comment on it without seeing it or anything like that. If you've got the, if the residential premises above, it's compartmented. Um, you're going to look at the coffee shop on its own facility. The coffee shop, I would say, um, you're going to use um, occupancy type B in there. Um, and again, look at, if you look at your travel distances, you may well find that you've got extended travel distances because of what you've got in there. You may find you've got an alarm system in there. You've got a slow fire, uh, medium or slow fire growth rate. You may well find that you've got extended travel distances anyway, um, but without a, a, a little more detail on there. Um, it's, you know, I can't really sort of give an answer to that, I'm afraid. Um, another question, could you please clarify halls of residence are definitely excluded from BS999, some of the profile tables so it still seem to list these as a building cap. Halls of residence are, um, if you're looking, it depends upon the, if it's so similar to a purpose built block of flats, um, halls, then you're going to go down the BS triple nine one route. Uh, BS triple nine one takes a similar methodology, if you like, to BS double nine double nine. You don't have the different purpose groups or anything like that. You've always got the same purpose groups, and that's C one and C two, C one, C two that are in there. Um, I've never used double nine double nine for halls of residence. If I'm honest, I've never really taught double nine double nine as a halls of residence thing there. Um, and then with final checks, what if there's an on-site fire service management allowance? Um, there aren't really many management allowances in double nine double nine. Um, what you might find that you're doing down that way then is you're going down the fire engineering route a little bit. Fire engineering takes even more notice of um, management and gives it gives probably more back than double nine double nine does on there. Um, Obviously, if you've got an on-site fire team, you'll need to look at the training of that, that you know, their levels of competency, everything, all, all that whole question, it's quite wide there. Um, someone said, will we get a copy of the slide? I think the whole, I think the whole presentation's been recorded. Um, I do apologise that I have actually, I, I have kind of flown through it a little bit on there. Um, <laughs> So yeah, um, I know I know that the um, I know that this doc this slide has been recorded. Um, so anyone wants to watch it again, you, you get to see my uh, my face on the screen, but you get more time to um, get the notes on there. So no problem there. Um, did BS double five double eight used to cover halls of residence? Yeah, I think part one used to cover halls of residence as it was part of the residential building um, type of thing there. And then is the application of BS double nine acceptable to a building designed to approve document which is being revamped? Um, if you are looking at a material change of use, then you're going to throw building rigs at it. Um, BS double nine double nine is a way of achieving compli compliance with the functional requirements of approved document of um, of the building reg. Sorry, so yes, in theory you can, uh, but if you're going to look at it at one part of the building, you've got to have a look at the impact that be it, that putting BS double nine double nine to one part of the building is going to have on the rest of the building as well. Um, there's some in the chat as well. Um, hopefully, I think we've uh, um, yeah, I think um, no more questions, guys, from the look of things. Um, which BS code re relates to new dwellings? Someone's asked on the chat there, yeah, that's BS triple nine one. Um, but obviously ADB volume one as well, you can still use that too. Um, um, thank you for your time, ladies and gentlemen. If there's no more chat, I think we've got all of the Q&A covered there. Um, any other questions? Okay, I think, uh, I think that's it. Over to you, Jordan. Thank you. 
Um, so thank you for joining us this morning, everyone, and thank you to Steve for providing that. Um, just a quick note to say that obviously um, we do hold fire safety courses at CABE, um, which Steve is also on board with providing. Um, so we do also offer the triple nine one and the double nine double nine courses. Um, the next scheduled dates for them are March, um, beginning of the month. We do also have the fire safety um, certificate course as well and principles of fire safety, which is the one day. Um, so if anyone wants to look into these things um, in a little bit more detail, please do go and have a look on our website at the course information. Um, we have January and February webinars confirmed. So in January, on Wednesday the 5th, we will be joined um, by Colm Gribben of Viltra, who will be discussing the importance of wastewater treatment. And then on the 2nd of February, we will have um, Tony Hopkin um, discussing new build housing defects. So if either of those sound of interest, please do go and book yourselves on. In the meantime, if anyone has any other questions or feedback that they would like me to pass on to Steve, just drop me an email um, and hopefully I will see you all online again very soon. Thank you.